Good morning. Welcome to Victorious Faith. I'm Cherry Campbell. We're studying how to live and not die. And our text scripture is Psalm 118, 17. I shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. And we have been talking, especially the last couple of weeks and this week, about our covenant of protection. And I was going through steps with you for how to walk in divine protection. And let me quickly list those for you again. And one is Psalm 91, 1, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. So we must dwell in the secret place of the Most High and under his wings. That is 24, 7. That is daily spending time with God. And secondly, we make him our protector, our deliverer, our shield. Psalm 91, 2 says, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. And Psalm 91, 9 says, if you make the most high your dwelling, even the Lord who is my refuge. And so you make him, just like you make him your savior, you also need to make him your protector and your shield. And then we said, we talked about the the force field, and we talked about meditating on the promises and building faith and speaking the word of God, which is a sword, the sword of the spirit, Ephesians chapter 6. Um, Verse 16 says, taking up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. And then the next verse 17 and taking the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So using the word of God as a sword. We also spent a couple days talking about taking uh, receiving the covenant of protection by taking communion. And you should do that. You should establish that in your life. And if you're married and if you have children, do it together. Do it with your spouse. Do it with your children. Do it with your grandchildren. And you go to the, uh, get the bread and the juice and open your Bible and read Psalm 91 and Psalm 121 and any and uh, all other scriptures that you are establishing in your life. And you are receiving them as covenant. And it can also be healing scriptures. You can receive the covenant of healing. It can be provision. You receive the covenant of provision, God meeting your needs. And whatever it is that you are establishing in your life and you are, um, you are receiving that covenant from the Lord, then you take those scriptures, the Bible and the bread and the juice, and you take communion to receive the covenant. And then... Know your angels are at work. And if necessary, as we talked about yesterday, even Jesus said in Matthew 26, 53, that he can call on his father and he will at once put at his disposal more than 12 legions of angels. And so we also can 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 call on the father and he will put at our disposal the angels to assist us. And then we talked about pleading the blood of Jesus. And we looked at how the Israelites were told to put the blood of the Passover lamb on the sides and tops of the door frames of their homes. And yesterday we also looked at Joshua chapter 2, where we saw in verses 12 to 21 that the spies that went into Jericho, who were protected by Rahab, promised Rahab that She and her household would be protected if they put the red or scarlet cord in the window. And that red cord, again, was a symbol of blood. And so we see that the applying of the blood of Jesus and the drawing of a bloodline can put up a protective shield. It is a protection. It is a wall of protection around us. It is a shield of protection around us. And we talked about even if you face an enemy, you can say the blood of Jesus is against you because we are using the blood 
of Jesus as our defense. Hallelujah. We've talked about being bold and having no fear. That when you are afraid, you become a slave to what you fear. But instead, you need to resist fear. And in Psalm 56, 11, it says, In God I trust, I will not be afraid. And I think some of you need to say that. Because there are some people who fear is just a normal part of your life. You better get over it. Because in 2 Timothy 1, God has not given us the spirit of fear. Fear is an evil spirit. And wherever you have fear, you are allowing an evil spirit to control your life. Wherever you allow fear, you are allowing an evil spirit to control and dominate your life. You need to break its power. And as I said yesterday, faith is the opposite of fear. Fear is the opposite of faith. So how do you get rid of fear? You increase faith. Increase faith. Build your faith for your protection. Build your faith that God is watching over you. God will deliver you. The Bible even calls fear a sin. And it puts in the book of Revelation, those who are fearful along with those who are murderers. It is a sin. And there are many, 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 many commands, Old Testament and New Testament. Do not fear. Why is it a sin? Because God says, do not fear for I am with you. It is a sin because if you are afraid, you don't believe that God is with you. You don't believe God will protect you. You don't believe God will deliver you. You don't believe God will take care of you and meet your need. That's why it is a sin. Because God says, do not fear, for I am with you. He always, whenever he said, do not fear, most all of those Old Testament scriptures, especially, always followed with saying, because I'm with you, because I'll never leave you, because I'll help you. God is with you. That's why you don't fear. And so you must say, as it says in Psalm 56, 11, in God I trust, I will not be afraid. I think you should say that right now. Say, in God I trust, I will not be afraid. Let's change that first phrase to modern English. I trust in God. Say that. I trust in God, I will not be afraid. Say it again. I trust in God, I will not be afraid. Say it one more time. I trust in God, I will not be afraid. And then Psalm 118, verse 6, the Lord is with me, I will not be afraid. So say that with me. The Lord is with me, I will not be afraid. Say it again. The Lord is with me, I will not be afraid. And say Psalm 56, 11, I trust in God, I will not be afraid. Say it one more time. I trust in God, I will not be afraid. And Hebrews 13, verse 6, so we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Notice that those that phrase, I will not be afraid, what can man do to me, is actually written over and over and over again in the Bible, and yet many Christians ignore it. They just plain ignore it. Some say, I can't help being afraid. Yes, you can. You're a liar if you say you can't help it because God said, don't do it. And if God said, don't be afraid, then it means you can not be afraid. And so you can't say you can't help it. You can. And how do you get rid of fear? Build faith. Build faith. I see it like the teeter-totter or the seesaw. When faith goes up, fear goes down. But if fear goes up, faith goes down. So in order to get fear to go down, you've got to put your, bring your faith up and keep your faith up, putting up the shield of faith. So you must resist fear. Don't be afraid of Storms. Don't be afraid of dogs. Don't be afraid of animals. Don't be afraid of guns and weapons. 
Don't be afraid of terrorists. Don't be afraid of death. Where, oh, death is your victory? Where is your sting? It's gone. Because we are more than conquerors. We are victorious. We are overcomers. You do not need to be afraid. And then, of course, that goes right with the next statement. Be bold. Be bold when you use your spiritual authority. Be bold when you say, in the name of Jesus, I take authority over you. I break your power, Satan. You shall not harm me. Isaiah 54, 17 says, no weapon formed against me shall prevail. No harm shall come near me. I will not be harmed in Jesus' name. I bind you, Satan. I bind that weapon. I command that storm be silent and be still. You be bold. Glory to God. And Joshua 1 9 says, be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. So you must be bold, be strong for the Lord, your God is with you. Be bold when you say the name of Jesus. Be bold when you plead the blood and apply the blood of Jesus. Be bold when you speak the word, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Be bold, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. I've quoted that scripture several times now. That's Ephesians 6.10. Ephesians 6.10. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. It's not your might. It's his might. And as I said yesterday, it doesn't matter if you're a little 80-pound old lady or if you're a little 8-year-old child and you're facing a person with a gun or a 200-pound muscle man. It doesn't matter because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. First John 4.4. 4. And you can be strong in the Lord and in the, and in the power of his might because Second Corinthians 10.4. For the weapons we fight with are not carnal. They're not of this world. They're not natural. They're not fleshly, but they're powerful through God to the pulling down of strongholds. You have greater power and authority in you than anyone in this world working by d- the devil's power. Y- greater is he that is in you to demolish. You have the authority and power to demolish strongholds. Praise the Lord. Be bold. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. So resist fear and be bold and be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might using your spiritual weapons, the name of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, the shield of faith, even the force field of God's power and and the blood, I think I said already, and the angelic assistance that you have and your spiritual authority. You rule and reign in this life. Now, I want to come to one more very important key to being protected. This is very important. Listen up. Because if you don't do this, none of the rest will work. If you don't do this one. Even the blood and the name sometimes can be run, run ineffective. Why? What is it? Obedience. And bottom line is if you're in disobedience, you lose your spiritual authority and your force field of protection. And that's where I said the seven spiritual laws all work together and you cannot be using your faith while you're in disobedience. You cannot be trying to exercise spiritual authority in the name of Jesus. I take authority over you while you're in disobedience. Disobedience then takes away your spiritual authority because it says in James, submit yourselves to God, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. And that's in James chapter four, verse seven, James four, seven, submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Notice submitting to God comes first and then resist the devil and he will flee from you. 
So if you are not submitting to God, and that means being obedient, then you cannot resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Because disobedience nullifies your spiritual authority. And it breaks down the shield of protection. So just walk in obedience to God and to his word. And then you can use your spiritual authority. You can bind and loose. You can rebuke the devil and cast him down. You can resist him and he'll flee from you. Amen. It's that simple. It's simple to understand. You live in obedience to God. And then you maintain your spiritual authority. And that's where I said this actually links to dwelling in the secret place of the Most High and abiding under his shadow, the shadow of his wings. If you're dwelling in the secret place of the Most High, you're dwelling in him, you're living in him, you're walking in Christ, you're listening to the Holy Spirit, you're following, you're communing, you're fellowshipping, and you're doing what he says to do, then you have your full spiritual authority intact. But if you get out of that place of dwelling in him and you're on your own and you're not listening to God and you're not obeying God, then you're on your own and you lose your spiritual authority or your power to various degrees, depending on how far you are from God, how far you are in in disobedience, you can totally lose it or lose some of it. It, it, It's really like God's protection is a shield and it is an umbrella and you stay in him and you've got full authority, but you get away from him and you are diminishing your power and authority the farther you get from God. And so with that, obedience is a majorly important part to being protected. You must obey. Now let me take that to this application. It means also being obedient to the Holy Spirit, or I should say to the promptings and the unctions of the Holy Spirit. And this then is also connected with wisdom because The Holy Spirit is the spirit of wisdom. Wisdom is God's answer, God's solution to any situation. Wisdom is knowing what God wants to do, what God, what is God's answer to a situation. And wisdom then is following the spirit in the steps of the spirit. And so we did a series called how to be led by the Holy Spirit. This is very important. How to be led by the Holy Spirit. Being led by the Holy Spirit is very, very important when it comes to not being hurt. And it can be not being hurt in any area of life. Relationally, not marrying the wrong person and getting in a mess By following the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will guide you and help you avoid wrong relationships. He can help you avoid wrong uh, financial decisions, business decisions, not getting in partnership with the wrong person, not investing your money in the wrong place, not spending your money in the wrong place or in the wrong way, buying the wrong thing that's going to break in two days. He can guide you. And when it comes to protection, listen up. One of the main ways God will protect you is by the leading of the Holy Spirit. And we did this series. You need to hear it because I don't have time to talk about it now. You need to go back and listen to it again. One of the most important things for any Christian to learn, one of the very top most important things for any Christian, I would hope they would learn it right away. That is how to be led by the Holy Spirit. Because if you can know how to be led by the Holy Spirit, he can teach you everything else you need to know. He can teach you in all the other areas. So you need to first quickly learn how to follow the Holy Spirit. 
And as it says in Romans, that the sons of God are led by the spirit of God. And that word son in the, in the Greek, New Testament written in Greek, is the word for mature, adult, full grown, fully developed. The Greek language has different words for a small child or an adult. The word son in Romans 8, verse 14, and it says, those who are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. That word son, it is the Greek word for adult son, not a child. It is specifically showing the difference between an adult and a child. A child doesn't know how to be led by the spirit. An adult has learned a spiritual adult. One of the characteristics of a spiritual adult is one who has learned to be led by the Holy Spirit. It's a characteristic of maturity, not childhood. And so one of the main ways, one of the most primary ways that God will protect you is by leading you. Go here or don't go. And he will give you those leadings, not usually by an audible voice. He may occasionally use an audible voice. Personally, I've never heard the audible voice of God. Some Christians have. More Christians have not heard the audible voice of God. And there's certainly no promise that God will speak to you audibly. You need to learn how to know the inward voice and the inward promptings. And I did the series on this, how to be led by the Holy Spirit. That would be one of the most valuable lessons you could ever learn and that you can teach your children. You can teach your church. If you're in the church, if you're a Sunday school teacher, if you're a pastor, one of the most valuable things you could ever teach anybody and you could ever learn yourself is how to be led by the Spirit, to know the voice of the Spirit and the promptings of the Spirit. They're two different things. The voice is actually when the Holy Spirit speaks clear, distinct words inside of you. Not with your, you don't hear with your physical ears, but inside he speaks clear words. And the promptings, we also call unctions, but I like the word promptings. They're They're nudges. They're like nudges of the spirit to do something or not to do something. In that case, not doing something, it's like we call it a check. We call it, it's like pulling the the reins back on a horse to hold him back. It's like putting on the brake. There's a pulling back. There's a restraining sense on the inside. And thinking, don't go there. Don't do that. And there's a restraining sense. There's a pulling back, withholding, holding back sense on the inside. When God is, the Holy Spirit is saying, don't do it. Don't go there. And then in the opposite, there will be the nudges, the pushes on the inside. Not physically, not anybody around you pushing On the inside of you, in your spirit, in your belly, the Bible calls the belly, the spirit of man, the innermost man of the spirit. Inside of you, there's nudges, there's pushings, there's promptings. Go, do this, go now, get up, get up and go, get up and go. Those promptings can save your life. You better learn them. You better follow them. Because Again, let me say, one of the most very primary ways God can save your life, save you from danger, save you from accidents, save you from being hurt, is by telling you, get out of here. Don't be here. And he doesn't say it usually with an audible voice, but with the little prompting on the inside, the nudging, the push, get up, get up, get out of here, go, leave now. Why? I mean, maybe you're sitting in a movie theater. You're watching a movie about Superman or whatever. And halfway through the movie, you get the 
prompting on the inside. Get up. Get out. Get out of here right now. Get out of here. Leave right now. And you think, but I'm watching a movie. I want to see the rest of this. Yeah, sit there until you get a gunman come in and shoot everybody. No, if the Holy Spirit is prompting you, get up. Get out of here right now. Don't argue. A lot of Christians are hurt because they begin arguing and reasoning. I don't want to leave. This movie is only half over. If he says get up and get out, then get up and get out. It'll save your life. Or if he says, don't go there, he probably even told you before you got there, don't go to the movie today. Don't go to that theater. Go somewhere else. Go to this other one. And he'll tell you, don't go there because he knows that there is danger. And one of the most primary ways he will save your life, he will keep you from being hurt. He will protect you from danger, from injury, from accident is by leading you where to go and where not to go, where to be and where not to be so that you're in the right place at the right time. And you're not in the wrong place at the wrong time. Those people in the movie theater were just in the wrong place at the wrong time, not hearing the Spirit of God say, get out of here. And I've got a lot more to say about that. I, I'll tell you more tomorrow about testimonies from 9-11 and the Twin Towers of people who were safe and protected because they followed God's, the Holy Spirit, the voice of the Spirit. And they were safe. God will save you when you follow His Spirit. Join me again tomorrow. It'll be very important. And remember, God loves you. You're blessed and highly favored by the Lord.